Welcome to this Battle of Ideas session. The title is The Law and Our Private Lives, an Abusive Relationship. My name's Luke Gittos. I work in the criminal law for humans uh, solicitors, and I'm the legal editor for Spiked Online. I'm going to say a very brief couple of words about what the debate is about and then introduce our speakers. Really, shortly to introduce, I'd only say uh, domestic violence has been in the news an awful lot. Rarely a week goes by, well, that's a slight exaggeration, but really a month goes by where some new announcement is made about policy changes or uh, the approach of the prosecuting authorities to dealing with domestic violence. Uh, couple that with a cultural environment where domestic violence is talked about an awful lot, whether it be celebrity domestic violence or the proliferation of domestic violence uh, in, in people's homes. So really we just wanted to sort of tease that out a little bit and say, well, uh, is this something to be worried about? On the one hand, we have statistics that say that domestic violence is falling, and on the other hand, it apparently remains true that two women a week are killed by their partners, which is obviously an extremely worrying statistic. So that's basically what we wanted to talk about, um, and just try and uh, understand a little bit about what this might involve. So I'm going to uh, introduce my uh, speakers in the order that I'm going to uh, ask them to speak. First, I'm going to ask uh, Barbara Hewson, who's a barrister uh, working at Hardwick uh, Chambers, a specialist in public law, and also a, a celebrated uh, contributor to uh, Spiked Online, where she writes about uh, all manner of legal issues. Um, so thank you very much for being here, uh, uh, Barbara. Second, I'm going to ask Kate uh, Brown to speak. Uh, Kate is a lecturer in social policy at the University of, of York. She is currently uh, researching for her PhD, um, and the, the research focuses on the care and control of vulnerable uh, groups. Uh, but before studying for her PhD, she, she developed a career in the third sector, and that include working as a manager for Leeds uh, Women's Aid, and before that, working as a support worker for women who had worked in the sex industry. I think I've got that right. And she spent the last seven years as a trustee for a women's charity. So um, thank you very much for being here, Kate. Third on my list um, is Jackie uh, Tapley. Jackie is Principal Lecturer and Associate Head at the Institute of Criminal Justice Studies. She is also, very interestingly, an independent facilitator for the Wessex branch of the CPS um, and is currently analysing and developing uh, a system for assisting professionals in dealing with uh, vulnerable uh, women and victims of um, uh, domestic violence. Um, so we're, it's great that she could be uh, on our panel uh, and we're really grateful for her to, uh, for being here. And I should also say that she stepped in at the last minute. That's probably the most important thing. We had um, a separate speaker lined up who sadly had to uh, drop out due to ill health. And Jackie has heroically uh, stepped in to fill the void. So thank you very much indeed for doing that. And that was really short notice. It was sort of 24 hours. So she's done incredibly well. Next to speak will be Helen Rees. Helen is a, uh, a reader in law at the uh, uh, London School of Economics and writes, has written extensively on the uh, regulation of private life and on the uh, definition, the legal, legal definitions of violence and abuse, I think. And she also uh, contributes regularly to Spiked Online. And um, um, thank you very much for being here, Helen. Uh, it's always great. We have hosted a, a few debates with Helen. She's always a very interesting uh, person to have on a panel. And lastly, um, uh, Nye Brewer sat... Uh, over here. Nye is a criminal barrister, uh, Nye in Bedford Row, working in uh, all manner of uh, complex and uh, not so complex uh, uh, criminal uh, matters in the Magistrates Court and Crown Court. But he's also the Europe next European champion of British parliamentary debating. So he's our celebrity speaker <laughs> on the panel. Uh, so you're, you're gonna, you'll be able to scrutinise his debating skills and see whether he was worthy of his title. So if we could start, please, with uh, Barbara. I don't have a background either in crime or in child protection work or indeed in domestic violence cases. So I come at this whole topic from a, a slightly oblique angle. One of the things I'm very interested in is the use of language in this particular area because originally, many, many years ago, I did a degree in English literature. That's always been my first love. And I think that one of the things that we really need to be alert to and sensitive to in discussing the area of the law in our private lives is the type of language that lawyers and policymakers use about private lives. We had in the opening session on privacy a very interesting discussion about language and in particular the pathologization, as it were, of private life. The idea that up and down the country, to use the 
rather dramatic language that was used by the Children's Commissioner recently. I think she said, in every town, village, and hamlet, children are being sexually abused. And I must say, I thought, I haven't heard that word hamlet used in that way for I don't know how long. So what we need to think about, I think, in this session is, should private life be seen as an inherently dangerous or potentially even toxic arena that the law either should or indeed does regulate? Uh, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? From where I'm sitting, I think that the law is arguably intruding too much into private life uh, and that the zone of privacy, which we should all enjoy to be ourselves at home in private, is being viewed suspiciously um, by courts and by activists as well. Uh, you see all sorts of statistics bandied about. I was at a, a conference recently where it was suggested that one in four children, for example, are being abused. And of course, I immediately said, I wonder where that statistic comes from, um, because it would imply a, a crime wave of, of, of very great proportions indeed. In fact, the statistics tell a slightly different story. We know from a 10-year study that the NSPCC did that over a 10-year period, abuse rates fell by a third. And that's consistent with a pattern of falling crime rates and falling homicide rates. So when people come at you with the argument, you know, two women die every week, of course, that is horrendous if they are killed by their partners. But equally, you have to fit that within the overall crime rate statistics. And you also have to compare it with death by other means, for example, car accidents. So is there such a problem as some people would like us to think? It seems to me um, that there is a desire to portray women in particular as vulnerable. And I'm always a little suspicious of this because in an earlier era, the idea of equality was that women aspired to equal status with men. They didn't want to be treated differently. They wanted to be treated in the same way and have access to the same opportunities. And I think what I see now, particularly in the way um, judges who come from a family background very often refer to people in families or to women, is as a kind of half adult. You're sort of midway between a child who is not yet um, fully adult and who is worthy of protection, but you're not equally regarded as fully autonomous. There is some interesting litigation, which isn't much talked about in the family division, about the vulnerable adult who is deemed not to be able to make choices for themselves, even though they are adults and they have, on the face of it, full legal capacity. Um, and this is something I've written about for an academic journal called Public Law. There are very few cases that have actually been decided, but what the family courts have developed is this idea that if you are making decisions that other people don't like, for example, you're living with someone who is a sex offender, say, the question is asked, should you really be doing this? Is that the right thing for you? And what some local authorities have been doing is taking private individuals to court so that a judge can scrutinize their decision making and inquire into whether or not they've got full legal capacity. And even if they have got full legal capacity, should they still be allowed to do this? And I have to say, I regard this as a particularly worrying trend. Um, because why should private decision-making and private relationships be subject to this level of scrutiny? Uh, and in one case, which in fact involved the adult son of elderly parents who all live together, um, the court was asked to make a whole range of orders policing their private life together, even down to the kinds of things they could discuss in private conversation. There were banned topics that they were not allowed to discuss at all. And it was all being done because it was suggested that the way this adult son treated his elderly parents was abusive, but there were no findings of fact as such to that effect. <coughs> so it was all being done on a precautionary basis before there had been any trial, any witness evidence, any conclusions drawn by a court after a full hearing. I've written about that case for Spiked. I've called it, I think, the judge in your living room. And what I'm concerned about is the idea that increasingly this is seen as a legitimate field of endeavour for our civil courts. 
and that some judges indeed feel rather proud of this development and, and speak about it in laudatory terms, as though this were a, a, a sign of civilization advancing. Um, so I'm, I'm throwing out quite a complex set of ideas here, really to kick off the discussion and to see whether anyone else feels the same sense of unease that I do at this particular line of development, um, or indeed whether there are people who think it's a good thing and that we should have more of it. Thank you very much, Barbara. Kate? Okay, well, I approached this question when I sat down to think about it. My starting point was my experiences when I used to be a support worker for women working in street prostitution. So we had a drop-in centre in the middle of the red light area in Leicester where it was open till midnight every night from about 10 in the morning. And we would see the most horrendous domestic violence cases that the, the women were living with day in, day out. So they would present... Um, after being stabbed, raped, um, held against their will for days on end. And they were in the middle of these relationships when we were working with them. So sometimes they wanted to take action, sometimes they didn't. Now, this was really frustrating for um, a group of women at the project who were there because we care about, you know, doing the right thing for women. Uh, really frustrating. And we wanted to do something. That's the overwhelming urge, is to do something. There's a helplessness that goes along with it. Do something, anything at all. And there would be colourful conversations about what we would do to the men who were perpetrating the violence if we could only get our hands on them. But of course, it wasn't our choice. It wasn't our choice about what should happen. And the women who in question weren't always in favor of the things that we, we thought were the best point, uh, that we thought were the best action. So we'd be encouraged sometimes, the level of risk was really high, we'd be encouraged sometimes to make um, third party statements about the, women, the violence that the women were experiencing because they were so vulnerable that they couldn't make the statements themselves. Later at Leeds Women's Aid, I was involved frequently in cases where women would make statements and then withdraw them, and then that was seen as very problematic for the police. They would want to pursue the case without the woman's consent. Very difficult situation for um, support workers trying to do the, do the right thing by, by a group of, of women. And it seems to me as though this urge to do something, do anything, is what we see underpinning government policy. So what we have is um, a policy focused overwhelmingly on the criminal justice system. We want to catch, punish and um, police the behaviours of offenders. Um, and of course the state should have laws to protect individuals against violence. But focusing alone on the criminal justice system has unintended consequences for the people it's supposed to protect. So we don't even know if arrest and prosecution do safeguard women in all cases. It doesn't always, you know, the, the, the research is inconclusive about that. The incessant monitoring and trying and, and risk reducing brings um, a gaze on the lives of some people that wouldn't have been there anyway. So sometimes the women who, who are in question are, see, are disapproved of because they're not taking the, see, what's seen as the right action to address the violence that they're subject to. So if they don't comply with the role of the vulnerable victim, there can be sanctions um, or subtle sanctions or subtle disapproval. Been in many, many multi-agency meetings, where, uh, MARAC meetings about high-risk women, um, where you hear people say, well, she won't do anything. Um, and she, she's just as bad as him. You know, a lot of the time it's her really causing a lot, of, uh, just as many of the problems, which we recognise um, sometimes as victim blaming. So I would say that domestic violence needs to be approached on a much wider basis, focusing on well-being, safety and equality of women with prosecution and policing as a part of that, but not the only focus. If you start from that point, the policy agenda is shaped very differently. So funding for refuges wouldn't be withdrawn. There would be further investment in legal aid. Strict immigration policies that keep women with their partners 
or risk deportation or no recourse to public funds, no welfare benefits if they leave them, they would be re-evaluated. Welfare reform policies that um, rely on increasingly conditional arrangements where you have to do something in, in, um, in order to get your benefits. We know from some research in the States that that affects women who are involved in violent relationships because they're more likely to be penalised under those systems because of the control, the control that's exerted on them. So there's antisocial behaviour systems for monitoring the behaviour of those from poorer backgrounds, um, which could mean that women are scared to call up because if they're seen as causing trouble in their um, communities, they might get evicted from their house. So I would say that domestic violence is a public issue, but it's not a public issue in the sense that we should be wading in and making decisions on the part of the victims. We should be addressing the institutions of confinement instead of individualising domestic violence. Just briefly to add, I don't think it's just the government who does that individualising. I think the public and the media are part of that as well. So, you know, you were saying about, Luke, about um, how we see it all the time. One of the things I get really frustrated about is the lack of the wider perspective that you see when those debates are, uh, are introduced. So... Nigella Lawson, it was just gossip about her. We just sort of had a view on what it was like about Nigella. And then for um, the one that really got me was Raoul Moat. Does everyone remember Raoul Moat? Um, who, you know, went, um, ran off and tried to... Uh, well, he tried to kill his ex-girlfriend and her partner, who he did kill. It was a classic domestic violence case. It had domestic violence written all over on it. There wasn't any debate about that being a domestic violence case. It was just this sort of fetish um, towards the individual. So at Lisa and Zaid, we used to have um, a GP who donated £50 every month after he read that donkey charities received 10 times the amount of donations um, than, than uh, domestic violence charities in the UK. So I think talking about gender power inequalities is almost a bit passe now. We sort of think, oh, we've gone a bit past that, haven't we? You're, some of you are probably thinking that now when I'm talking. But I would argue that domestic violence should be given attention within a context of gender inequalities and that goes beyond policing the behaviours of individual men and women. Great, thanks Kate. Um, Jackie. Okay, um, I'd just like to add to Luke's introduction, I was actually coming to the um, festival anyway because I'm on a panel later, it wasn't because I was a sad person and didn't have anything else to do with it. <laughs> that's what it's all sounded like. <laughs> right, I'm going to read from a script because I have a habit of uh, talking for England and if I don't keep to a script, I'll go off on a, on a tangent and well, I won't make any more sense. So I'm going to put it into historical context to understand why we're where we are today and why perhaps laws are required to intervene um, in, in private relationships. Uh, for centuries, violence within the home has been tolerated and it's very much been condoned by a patriarchal society which has afforded men privilege privileges above those of women and children. So there's an instant power imbalance that's always been within society. And it advocated that a man's home is his castle and that it's a man's right to control his wife and family. And using violence was actually uh, allowed uh, within reason, uh, was an accepted way of doing so. So a number of laws, we had laws, we had state intervention that actually enabled men to behave in this way. So state intervention has always been there, but the state intervention in the past was that of male legalistic law, which actually allowed men to behave in this way. So it's not that it's new that the state is intervening, it's just intervening in a different way and perhaps rebalancing the power uh, differentials. Uh, an example of that is the previous law of provocation, which actually protected men from charges of murder when they murdered their partners and replaced it with manslaughter, arguing that the man had been provoked. And we've all heard judges up until very recently recently making really stupid statements about a nagging wife who tried the patience of a saint, therefore it's understandable that he murdered her. First wave feminism in the 19th century did begin to challenge some of this male monopoly of law, where women historically were totally excluded from law and lawmaking. So women didn't have an opportunity to debate any of the laws that were there, and the power of the state was very much in the hands of the men uh, that ran the state. Married women were denied the status of legal subjects. Instead, their legal existence by marriage was suspended and incorporated into that of their husbands. Uh, they struggled to gain legal rights 
rights for women in marriage, education, property and finance, seeking some autonomy over their own lives. Uh, wives thus deemed as their husband's legal property actually allowed men to control, chastise, beat, imprison, recapture, because they legally owned women's bodies, uh, enabling them to rape with impunity because it was a man's conjugal right to do so. And it should be remembered that rape within marriage was only recognised as a crime as recently as 1991. When I first got married in 1983, I didn't know that I was actually accepting that if it took my husband's whim that I could actually be raped and do nothing about it. I didn't know that as a young woman when I first got married. Second wave feminism took up the mantle in post-war Britain in the 1960s and 70s, witnessed a number of social movements and women's liberation was one of them. They began to reveal the, ex uh, reveal the extent of violence within the home, uh, perpetrated against women and children, and the inadequate response from the criminal justice agencies if they did require help. It was far easier to assume that the woman had done something to provoke their husband's anger and therefore deserved the punishment, rather than to actually challenge the behaviour of the perpetrator and the values of a society that actually deemed such abuse to be acceptable. Myths and stereotypes help to legitimise such claims that the victims provoke their own abuse. Well, if they don't like it, they'd leave, wouldn't they? That used to be a very common thing that we used to hear. But the impact of abuse is far more complex. It undermines confidence. It undermines self-esteem. Many victims are too afraid to leave because they know what the perpetrator is capable of. And the majority of those two women that are killed uh, each week, is the, is the risk is highest when they're about to leave or when they've just left. That's why many victims don't leave. The view that domestic violence is an anger management issue has now been disproved to a certain extent, and we're far, uh, there's a far greater understanding of the insidious nature of abuse, and that's reflected in the revised definition of domestic abuse that the Home Office have brought in now, which refers to controlling behaviour and coercive behaviour. Domestic abuse has got very little do, to do with anger and loss of control. It's the total opposite. It's about controlling behaviour. If it was a case of anger and loss of control, why don't they beat up on their colleagues at work or people in public? Why do they reserve it for, for the home? If it's purely anger management, they'd be losing their temper with everyone, wouldn't they? People they worked with that didn't agree with them, that didn't do as they were told. Feminist campaigners have been greeted with great hostility and with very little support from the government, and this resulted in women having to provide their own protection and support, hence Refuge Women's Aid and various other organisations. Whilst violence on the street was condemned, somehow violence perpetrated by an intimate partner is considered as a mitigating factor rather than aggravating one, and that's something that's always surprised me. Um, surely violence by somebody you're in an intimate relationship with, there's an element of trust there, uh, should abuse really be allowed. So we've seen the shift over the last three decades, uh, and it can be considered staggering. We've gone from the police not doing any action, and it's just a domestic, which is lower on the police priority than, than stray dogs, to the implementation, rather, of specialised courts for domestic abuse. The catalyst, it could be argued, has been the wider politicisation of victims of crime. It would have been difficult for a government claiming to put victims at the heart of the criminal justice system and still ignoring the thousands of victims of domestic abuse and, and sexual violence. Now that intimate abuse has been recognised as a real crime, there has been a range of initiatives, policies and legislation introduced in an attempt to deal with it. But the campaigning of women's groups has paved the way for the recognition and response to other people who suffer abuse. Domestic abuse isn't just a women's issue, a feminist issue. There are male victims of domestic abuse, and we're not looking at that enough. Female victims have trouble admitting they're abused. It's far more difficult, perhaps, for men to admit it because of issues of masculinity, perhaps police responses. Victims of same-sex abuse, again, have other st uh, stereotypes and myths. Honour-based violence, something that wasn't recognised, it was too culturally sensitive, has been seen as a form of domestic abuse and is being addressed. And teen abuse uh, is very much more recently being held as a major government concern. And whilst another, a number of government campaigns have targeted at this group, the government's still very reluctant to support an approach that would assist in the prevention of abuse. And what we really need is education. We need education early on so that abuse is tackled early on and young people know uh, that it isn't acceptable and perhaps we'd stop it escalating to the awful abuse we see in the papers. Jackie, thank you very much. Uh, Helen? Um, that dovetails really nicely because um, 
you've talked a lot about the history there, and I'm going to um, focus in on um, something very recent that um, you mentioned towards the end of what you were saying there, which is the new um, definition of domestic violence, which was, as you mentioned, introduced by the Home Office um, in March this year. And I know many people in the audience will know what, this, uh, what the new definition consists of, but I'm just going to start by reminding you, and then I'm going to tell you why I don't like um, that new definition. So, as Jackie mentioned, um, it's... Um, defines domestic violence as including coercive behaviour and controlling behaviour, including financial abuse, psychological abuse and emotional abuse. And then we're told in a little bit more detail that um, coercive behaviour includes humiliation of your partner and controlling behaviour includes a range of things. It's basically defined as a range of acts that are designed to make your partner dependent on you. And those include, but are not limited to, acts whereby you exploit your partner's personal resources for your own gain and um, regulating your partner's everyday behaviour. Now, that definition has been very, very widely welcomed by people on the panel, by um, women's groups, the police, um, obviously the Home Office, and it's right to say that it's really, it's nothing new. It really crystallises a trend that's been um, taking place, as I, I would say, really in, since the 1990s. But I'm not somebody who welcomes that expanded definition of domestic violence. And there are lots and lots of reasons that I don't welcome it, but because Luke will start to jump up and down, I'm going to limit myself to just focusing on one particular reason that I don't like that expanded definition of domestic violence. And that is really that these concepts emotional abuse, controlling behaviour, are absolutely in the eye of the, the beholder. You know, one person's humiliation of their partner is another person's robust argument with their partner. One person's attempt to regulate their partner's everyday behaviour is another person's desperate attempt to set down a family routine. This is very much in the eye of the beholder. And I think what I'm really trying to say here is that those, and this chimes very much with the session which some, many people will have gone to earlier about privacy and intimacy and, and the public sphere, is that those sorts of ideas of how you communicate with your partner, how you talk to your partner, how you relate to your partner, those can really only be understood from inside the relationship. That's a shared communication, a shared understanding between partners that develops over time, how you relate, how you talk, how you interact. And it doesn't, from my point of view, make sense for somebody from the outside, be they a police officer, a social worker, a judge, to come in and try to analyse how the partners are interacting with each other. Because really, what the law is doing here, which I, as a lawyer and as a woman, um, find very, very frightening, is that the law is actually setting down a standard of how we relate to our nearest and dearest. It's setting down a standard of how we talk to our loved ones. And that's something I find frightening. I find it frightening because it can only inevitably be subjective and arbitrary and discretionary and leave power in the hands of judges and social workers and police officers. And it offends me as a lawyer. I was brought up to believe in the idea of the rule of law, the idea of laws being relatively clear, and for us as citizens to know when we were on the right side of the law and when we were transgressing. This isn't like that. This, to me, offends against the rule of law because nobody will know if and when they're an, they are an emotional abuser, if and when they are indulging in controlling behaviour. And I want to illustrate this, if Luke stop, doesn't wave cards at me yet, by an anecdote. And this is an anecdote that some of you who don't mix in academic circles probably won't believe and will think that I'm exaggerating, but I promise that I'm telling the truth. And those of you who are more familiar with academic worlds will probably believe me. I went to a conference at Easter, and there was one paper that was given by a researcher into domestic violence. And she was actually researching domestic violence within lesbian and gay relationships. And what she'd done was she'd done a sort of middle, mid-size study 
where she'd asked lesbians and gay men to come and talk to her. She hadn't asked for domestic violence victims. She'd asked people to come and talk to her about their experiences of relationships, usually previous relationships. And there were two things that I thought were very interesting about what she found. The first was the scale of domestic violence that she found within lesbian and gay relationships. And here you may think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. She'd found rates of domestic violence of over 90%. And it really made me want to say to her, look, let's just call it 100 and we can all go home <laughs> and have a drink. You know, let's not look for the other five or six. The other thing that was really interesting about what she'd found, and remember, this was... Oh, my goodness. I haven't finished my anecdote yet. <laughs> this, was a, um, this was a random um, sample that she found. She'd found all domestic violence victims and no domestic violence perpetrators. Now, you would have thought that if this was an objective phenomenon that we could see, that she would have found roughly 50-50. But that, to me, illustrates that this is a subjective concept. This is someone who, you know, she's imposing her view of what a relationship should be like onto those people that she's interviewing. And the second thing that it really illustrated to me was that we are seeing domestic violence victims all around us. We're encouraged to see other people, and indeed ourselves, as domestic violence victims. And because I'm going to get another card waved at me in a minute, I'll just... I'll just finish by saying, and this, this again very much um, chimes in with the um, previous plenary session this morning. To my mind, what we're, <laughs> what we're seeing here is we're seeing a distrust of intimacy itself. The aspects that the government in that definition describes as domestic violence are actually inherent in any close relationship. I defy any of you to manage not to regulate your partner's everyday behaviour. It's certainly something that I can't do. I need to phone up and find out if they've done their homework already. <laughs> and just to finish, and this is my final point. Well, you know, if, if you think about a range of acts designed to make your partner dependent, I mean, maybe you'll tell me I don't know what love is, but that to me is almost a definition of the process of falling in love. So we're seeing here intimacy redefined as violence. Great, thank you, Helen. No applause. No, 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 no. She's already overrun, right? <laughs> How long? I have five. Nine. You have just as long as everyone else. Which is six minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I'm acutely aware that I am the only male on this panel on a subject which can become a, a little genderized at times, and which is why I'm so pleased that the fire door or flung <laughs> object exit, as I like to call it, is so easily accessible. But I hopefully what I have to say will not be too controversial. And what I want to do is directly respond to uh, what the last speaker has said, because in my opinion, the expansion or, or uh, extension of the definition of domestic violence is wholly a good thing and something which should have been done a very long time ago and is part of a lot of good work that Keir Starmer has done as the Director of Public Prosecutions, other than cutting the funding for barristers. And the reason for that is because at a practical level, we have a real problem with domestic violence in the criminal court. I deal with domestic violence both on the side of the prosecution and on the side of the defense on a very regular basis. As it so happens, I'm appearing in a domestic violence trial uh, on Monday morning in Canterbury. And the problem that we have is, even when it's possible to prove that the defendant is guilty of the offense as charged, and there are all kinds of problems with that that we can talk about as well, but even then, the court is limited in what it can do in relation to sentencing because it is presented with a single offence, which is the immediate offence before it, which will be the particular act of violence which resulted in the police being called on that particular day, which resulted in um, the proceedings starting. And so when they come to be sentenced, these defendants, and it's acknowledged by the court, by the complainant or the victim by this stage, that there is a long history of abusive behaviour in both senses of the word, both in terms of practical uh, physical violence and in terms of the wider sense of abuse. The court is limited to that single offence because the, that is the only charge that's before them. And quite understandably, our legal system says you can't be sentenced for matters which have not formed the subject of a charge which you've been convicted of. And so what you find is that if I punch my wife, I'm likely to receive a far smaller sentence than if I punch somebody in the pub. And in my opinion, that's wrong, that it should be the other way around. 
that a punch in the pub, serious as it may be, is less serious than assaulting someone who you have a trust relationship with and who is vulnerable because of the fact that they live with you. Now, the advantage of extending the definition of abuse is that police officers, when they think about how are they going to charge, prosecutors, when they think about how they're going to present their case to the judge, will have in mind this wider conception of abuse and will ensure that in the appropriate cases where conviction is right, that defendants can be sentenced appropriately for the full extent of their offending behavior. Now, the previous speaker wrote a fantastic article. I recommend you all read it on Spiked, which I enjoyed a great deal. A very humorous article. And there were essentially three arguments. And I want to very quickly respond to those. And the first is the argument that was expanded on today, which is that it's all in the eye of the beholder. It's subjective. Well, subjectivity is absolutely central to our legal system. Almost every offense you care to name has a subjective element to it. Let's take the example of provocation, which has been talked about earlier. We still have a defense of provocation. The name has changed and some of the words have changed, but it's effectively the same thing. And that is, if you murder somebody, but the court agrees that you reacted in a reasonable way to provocation, this is obviously boiling it down a great deal, then you're not guilty of murder. You're guilty of the far less serious offense of manslaughter. You don't have a mandatory life sentence. You only have a discretionary life sentence. Now, if we can have subjective concepts like how reasonable is a reaction to provocation at the heart of probably the most serious offense in the criminal calendar, why is it not right that we have these subjective concepts at the heart of other offenses as well? We understand that in order for someone to be charged with an offense, a police officer has to agree that the behavior has gone well beyond just the sort of regular uh, argy-bargy in a relationship. Uh, the, the complainant has to have decided that as well, to bring the matter to the police. A prosecution lawyer has to look at it and consider the matter to be so serious as to be criminal. Magistrates have to look at it and allow it to be committed to the Crown Court. A judge has to allow it to go before a jury. And then the fundamental and final arbiter of moral choice in our society, 12 randomly selected people, all of them, have to agree that this behavior is not merely unattractive, unreasonable, but that it is so serious that it's criminal. And that's why we can have subjective concepts like this in our legal system, because you need all these people to agree that this was so serious that it wasn't just unattractive, that it was a criminal act that's worthy of criminal sanction. The, the other argument that was made very quickly at the end, and if I can respond to it, was this idea that we're encouraging to see people as victims. No, I wouldn't agree with that. We're encouraging people to recognize people who are victims and who are not being recognized as victims at the moment because of this incredibly restrictive definition that we've used for so many years. And, and finally, this idea uh, that it's a distrust of intimacy. The definition, I just looked it up again on the computer, is controlling coercive and threatening behavior. Now, I've had some bad relationships in my day, <laughs> but I hope <laughs> that I can't be accused of any of those particularly damaging words. In my respectful submission to you, this expansion is in the interest of everybody. This isn't a gender issue. I've read different statistics in the last few days preparing for this, but some say one in five, some say two in five men are victims of domestic violence, working in domestic violence, you often find that the person who is charged may well be the victim, and it's the woman taking advantage of the system, uh, realizing that the police are on the doorstep, throwing allegations, uh, and that they, they're there too. But this will allow us, as practitioners, to finally start to truly weigh the seriousness of domestic violence. Thank you very much. Okay, now we can clap the whole panel. Okay, I can see people are wanting to come in, and I'm going to come to you as quickly as I can. I'm going to just ask a couple of very quick questions in my own, because I've got the microphone. <laughs> I wanted to ask Kate, you effectively this tension about doing nothing, this impulse, I find that a really interesting idea, and particularly when does this become a public issue? Mm -hmm. So you have a very difficult tension between women's private lives and our and their interaction with, with public life and the prosecutorial authorities. But a lot of the arguments that are made, and there has been some awful cases of escalating violence against particular women. So a lot of the time, domestic violence is talked about as a signal offence. Um, and there's been a history of cases where 
the police and prosecutorial authorities have not taken uh, women seriously with very tragic results, women being murdered at the hands of their partner. And they rightfully uh, come under scrutiny for their failings because these women are genuinely treated as liars and deceitful and it has a tragic end. So that's one question. How do we deal with, with, with those kind of cases? Because I understand that there's a question about always resorting to the criminal justice system, but is there an alternative tension, which is actually the criminal justice system genuinely hasn't been taking some very serious cases seriously? Um, and to uh, Nye and to that side of the, the, the argument broadly, I'm just worried about, because Nye, you used the phrase, uh, we, we are recognising people who are victims. But of course, you know that people aren't actually victims until someone has been convicted. They are complainants. And the point of becoming a victim is going through due process. And it was striking that Nigella Lawson was immediately referred to as a domestic violence victim and it, it, eventually that turned out to be the correct terminology to use because Charles Saatchi took himself in and accepted a caution and accepted his guilt. But of course, there's all sorts of different um, uh, reasons why he might have done that. So is this very problematic language that you're using, recognising people who are victims, when necessarily there is a process that needs to be gone through in order for them to uh, achieve or, or you know, arrive at that status, as it were? So I'll open those two questions up, and then I'll come straight out to the audience. Anyone can jump in. Well, seeing as I was named, I, yes. I have to directly respond. Um, I'm not saying throw away due process. Absolutely not. I'm just saying that at the moment, the definitions that we use mean that we cannot truly give people the status that they deserve when it is proved that they have had this sort of behavior perpetrated against them. Because the wider sense of behavior, which I think everyone in this room accepts, is something which results in victimhood if indeed it happens. If that's proved at the moment, doesn't form part of the offence. But people can, men, can, men and women, can be subject to extremely draconian measures without um, any due process whatsoever. So if you have, you're arrested, you're, you are uh, interviewed, you are put on bail, you can be removed from your house, you can be prevented from seeing your children, mm -hmm. all without due process. And part of that is saying that this woman's account is to be taken seriously, but part of that is, has a really serious practical effect on that a defendant's life. Isn't there a problem there? No, I mean, that's all due process. You, the police can only interview if they have reasonable suspicion. You can only be removed from your house for bail conditions if the magistrates or the judge agrees that there are uh, significant grounds to fear that you would commit further offences, interfere with witnesses, or fail to surrender uh, unless those bail conditions are put in place. That is due process. Um, you, you can't simply focus on conviction and sentence as the only parts of due process. Okay, I, Ellen? I don't, that's not my conception of due process when we get down to those layers of reasonable suspicion. But I think what this, to me, what this misses is just all the layers of regulation that come even below that. I mean, even if you're right, you might be right, that nobody is going to be convicted of emotional, well, you weren't saying that, you were saying nobody was going to be wrongly convicted of emotional mm -hmm. abuse before, you know, 12 um, good men and true, good men and women and true. Even if that were right, there are so many layers of regulation below that. So we are talking about the teacher having a quiet word with the, um, you know, the parent because they've seen some inappropriate behaviour in the playground. We are talking about a welfare officer putting in a sentence into a welfare report. There seems to be some issues of emotional abuse in this relationship. There's no due process there. But yet, those sorts of... Um, comments, suspicions, worries do have immense implications when it comes to, for example, um, treatment of children at school, treatment of children in um, residence disputes and so on. So I'm not nearly so sanguine about the idea that it all happens over there with the jury and judges and so mm. on, and nothing happens over here with teachers, social workers and a much lower level of um, due process. Okay, Barbara. I think the problem with expanding what constitutes abuse is that you end up with the really perverse consequence, which is that officialdom then spends a lot of time worrying about things which may not be quite as serious. And then what tends to happen, and as we have seen, the really serious cases tend to then fall through the net. So that's one problem. And the other problem is that if you have a very elastic definition of abuse, and I'm with Helen on her point about the subjectivity of all of this, um, it basically then becomes behaviour of which officialdom disapproves. So if you're Richard Dawkins, bringing up your child a Catholic is seen as mental abuse, or so he is quoted as saying. Yeah. So it can be anything. You know, Smoking in front of your children can be seen as abuse. Smoking in front of your partner might be seen as a form of abuse of the partner, and so on and on. And that's the problem. It becomes a never-ending catalogue 
um, of whatever happens to be disapproved of by someone at the time, and that's what I find problematic about it. Um, Jackie or Kate, do you want to come back on anything? Well, I just think in, in case of Helen's argument there about teachers picking up on things, we have, and it's a strange time to really sort of say that's a bad thing, because we've seen some appalling cases recently of, of child abuse where people didn't step in, where there were obvious examples of abuse, so obvious that, you know, a paediatrician didn't pick up on broken bones, etc. <clears throat> so I, I think we've, it's time that we did actually stop turning a blind eye and actually accepting some responsibility, you know, and not thinking it's not our job. If abuse is happening, then we should respond to that, uh, particularly when there are obvious signs. And that sometimes it's not so subject, uh, subjective. We're far more educated now as to the type of behaviour that some of us would agree would be abusive. And we are coming to a stage where there's, there's quite a lot of agreement as to what we think is acceptable behaviour and what isn't acceptable uh, behaviour. Yes, we're all very different. We'll all tolerate different different levels of perhaps controlling behaviour um, and, and that might suit us in some ways but it's when it crosses that line and it starts to impinge uh, on somebody's daily life about who they can see, where they can go, whether they can work, whether they've got access to any financial money, it's when it starts to step beyond that line and I think that we all have a responsibility that if we are concerned about something that we should actually have the right to say something rather than fe feel fearful if we do say something Think. We should be in a situation where openness um, over this, this type of subjectivity is actually welcomed. Great. Thanks, Jackie. And Kate, just before we go out. OK, well, I think the problem about that you were sort of specifically asking about, about when to do something and when not to, and the, the failings, the failings that some people aren't taken seriously within the criminal justice system, I don't necessarily think that um, I mean, I'm not a legal expert, but I don't think that broadening the definition is going to sort that out. I think that there's much more going on about how due process is applied and some of the subtle sort of as you as you cast the net wider, who ends up picked up in that net will be usually people behaving in ways that perhaps elite, more elite groups think isn't acceptable. So that net, as you cast it wider, won't be equally applied, and I think that would be a concern of mine, although I don't know the ins and outs of how, it, you know, how it's likely to play out. OK, thanks. Well, I'm going to come back to the audience. Uh, my point is that this whole debate's entirely misframed. I speak as the author of a major review, a peer-reviewed uh, science rather than advocacy, studies into domestic violence, uh, and the picture is radically at odds with what people and government and most of the panel uh, think. There's no such thing as a dominance interaction between the sexes and any species, including the humans. It's to be made down and controlled to continue in it. But uh, the most telling study, Cross et al, 2012, they found in a domestic situation, uh, women and girls, their favoured mode of, uh, of aggression actually is physical violence. But in males, in any domestic or in any situation where a female will be targeted, their typical uh, behaviour is to actually back off. If you look at, it's been conceded that it's roughly equivalent, sort of 40-60 sort of ratio between male and, and female victims. But that doesn't, that's in police reports and in anonymous surveys. But of course, that fails to take into account the sex differential of up to a factor of 10 uh, between uh, female and male. male you know, males don't report uh, a lot more than females don't report. And even if you take out demand characteristics, as John Archer is the leading authority on violence in Britain, even then you find a massive sex differential where males still not, are not reporting. Um, if, you look, um, if you look at unilateral and serious domestic violence, females perpetrate compared to males are between three and six times as much. If, even if you assume that there are roughly equivalent uh, levels of domestic violence, male and female, female and male, because if you think about the, the sex differences in upper body strength, hitting power, multiplied by the sex difference in frame weakness susceptibility to injury, as Louise Dixon at the University of Birmingham points out, you'd expect a sex different injury of 20 to 1. In actual fact, it's between parity and 2 to 1 at, at most, which again indicates a massive predominance of female perpetrated domestic violence. When it comes to control, um, that's again predominantly uh, uh, female. It's to do with mate dialogue. We haven't got time to go explain. But the picture is radically at odds with what's, what's currently. And the result of that is, is that what, what, in cases where it's male restraint or it's female, a false allegation are completely overlooked. I've got two questions or points. One is, I think in the past, 
campaigns around domestic violence used to much more argue that women needed equality to get out of the home and that it, as long as they could do that, get out of that uh, any kind of a, a problematic relationship, then it, that would be job done in a, in a sense. They could leave their partner. And the problem was that women uh, didn't have equality in terms of jobs, etc., made it more difficult for them to get out of the home. It seems to me now we do have that equality and instead what we're saying is that women don't really recognise uh, when they are being abused. They don't recognise the sign. They need to be educated to spot the signs and basically they're just kind of vulnerable, uh, stuck more in that situation. And then just a quick question I had uh, to the point that was made at the end there. Is the only choice between turning a blind eye and calling in the state and the authorities. Is that the only choice that we have, or is there a different uh, choice that we could make? Just to sort of add to this point of this gentleman down here, I do find it very interesting that only two of the panellists mention male victims of domestic violence, especially in respect to this expanded definition. I kind of want to go on to the point that the first speaker made about language, because a lot of these laws and legislation do, are feminised, they, they, they do portray uh, women as vulnerable instead of victims as vulnerable. And in a, opposition to that, they do sort of portray men as invulnerable. And I think <coughs> it's sort of, some of the points that I would have made have perhaps already been made, but I think it's quite interesting. I think it's the fourth speaker uh, referred to rape in marriage. Though technically to this day, uh, my understanding is that men can't be raped at all. They can only be... Women can't rape. They can. Mm. Women can't rape, but men can be raped. But don't you feel, don't you think that that's a little bit dissonant to the actual situation there? Because it's like, well previously it used to be defined as penetrated with object or forced to penetrate. I think the language as it is now doesn't even necessarily acknowledge that men can be victims. And I think domestic violence violence is a genderless, you know, mm. crime really. Mm. It's, it's not, it's not a, a crime of women or a crime of men, it's both. And I find it very interesting that, especially considering how under-reported uh, under male victims probably are, that the majority of the panel doesn't seem to have highlighted it as even an issue. It's a question to anyone and everyone on the panel in relation to the term victim and relating to Barbara's point at the beginning about language. So, Luke, you implied that in the event of um, a conviction happening, uh, then the person who um, was the subject of the case then does become a victim, as if it's... So there's some kind of objective criteria. I'm not sure about that, and indeed I'm not sure about the entire usage of this term in this debate and others. So my question essentially is whether... Victim is an objective fact, which is then decided by an act of the legal system, or whether it is a form of identity which culture is increasingly applying widely, through which people come to think of their experience in a particular way. In other words, can anybody ever objectively be a victim, or is it a thing we are encouraged to think of ourselves as? I'm wondering if the panel would accept, at least, that women as legal subjects are being degraded in this whole discussion. I, I made a point earlier, so I apologise if I'm repeating it, about the Best Bar Non initiative in Scotland, where the police are now training uh, bouncers to intervene and ask drunk women if they really want to go home with the guy they're going home with. And it's couched in a sort of stranger danger language. You say, he's a stranger, he might be a predator. And it's like child safety language being applied to women. In terms of rape in Scotland since 2009, men have to show active consent. So if the woman's too drunk, even though the guy doesn't think he's raping her, he could be seen as raping her. So again, the woman's not seen as having any uh, active agency there. And in domestic violence, when you talk to the police, they, say, they explain that it's now you have to take positive action. So even if you turn up and the woman says, look, it's fine, go away, they have to treat the woman like a child and say, actually, I'm going to split you up. In all these cases, women appear to be degraded 
Now, do you accept that? And if you do, do you not see that as something of a problem? But I just wanted to address something towards Nye, who gave a very sort of uh, spirited defense of the new um, definition of domestic abuse. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, first of all, how that plugged into Helen's comments about the rule of law, because of the fact that this definition it is broader, and it's also more vague, and it will require a lot of case law to establish what exactly it means. What do you think about what Helen said about um, how, um, until we get that, no one's really going to know where they stand? And you sort of presented uh, your argument in terms of this, uh, give us the tools and we can finish the job as prosecutors sort of thing. In, in relation to that and what Kate was saying, is that just not an extension of the helplessness that you know, she was sort of feeling uh, towards uh, women who are uh, abused? Because the fact is that the criminal law is a very blunt instrument. So maybe the fact is that you just can't really do very much in your position as a prosecutor at all. And what we need is a lot more of the sort of civic support that Kate was talking about not more uh, sort of lawyers doing lawyery things. Great, thank you. Panel, do you want to come back to anything that you've heard? I'm really interested in this idea of women being degraded subjects, and because that's a concern I've had for a long time, and, and even before the Sexual Offences Act came in in 2003, I was expressing concern that policymakers in this country have very much been um, sold the, the radical feminist idea, which derives from people like Catherine McKinnon, in the United States, which is in turn based upon a particular type of feminism that evolved in the 1880s, which was linked with the social purity movement, which is very much about the idea that um, you know, women are pure, that men are nasty predators. Uh, and it's this stereotyping, which is very influential, and it's still lingering on. It's a kind of substrata of a lot of the thinking that goes on. Um, and the problem about it is, is that it demands that women be protected rather than that women be equal. Um, and I think that is problematic because protection also implies control and regulation. And so what you find being built into this is this idea that government, or um, there's a wonderful writer called Laura Augustine who writes about the sex trade, and she uses the term maternalism as opposed to paternalism. It's maternalism, and it's, it's saying that, you know, um, we're very concerned about you, uh, and we think that your behaviour is very problematic, and therefore we want to define certain people as... as um, behaving in the wrong way, the deviant or whatever it is, um, and that's how we control, control the unruly poor or people whom we've decided we don't approve of for one reason or another. And I think this whole idea is, is, is problematic and we need to interrogate it more, so I'm glad that some people have brought this up. I think the, I mean, the problem, the problem with, with rape in particular, if we're talking about the issue of consent, is that in no other crime um, do we instantly look at what the victim was doing at the time of the offence. You know, if you have a burglary, a police officer won't ask if you've been drinking or what you were wearing. Uh, rape really is a case of where it's viewed specifically on, well, what were you doing at the time? And before the 2003 Act, the issue of consent didn't really come into it. It was about the perpetrator's reasonable belief. And that wasn't very helpful. Uh, the 2003 Act is, is the first time in any legislation to do with rape that we've actually placed some responsibility on the aggressor, as in, was it reasonable? Not that it was reasonable, but did the person was the person in a fit state to consent? So if somebody has been drinking and they're unconscious, then it's quite obvious that they're not in a fit state to be able to give their consent. Therefore, it isn't appropriate to have sex with that person, even though you you might have thought earlier on in the evening they were giving it. So it's about offering some some um, guidance to, to people who might actually think that their behaviour is OK, but actually saying you must seek consent. Uh, and that goes for male victims and, and female victims. Um, and I think this idea about women are autonomous. Yes, women are autonomous, and educated women can still be abused, as can educated men. It's about knowing uh, what your choices are. And if you do suspect that something's going on, you don't have to go automatically to the police. You can talk to other people to find out, again, what your choices are. And I think it's very important that, that people are aware of, of different choices. It doesn't have to be a matter for the criminal justice system necessarily. It, but if a person isn't happy in the situation that they're in, they should be able to have the autonomy and the choice to know what is available for them, for them to find out more information. 
Ellen? I, don't, I really don't want to get sort of I don't want to get too um, embroiled in the subject of rape because that's something I've been talking about and writing about a lot. But I, I think what's happening here with I mean, obviously you're right that where you have a woman who has drunk so much that she's passed out, then of course she can't give any meaningful consent. But I think, I mean, of course it happens, but I don't think that's, um, you know, the problem that it's um, presented to be. And I think what's happening there is, much like the domestic violence definition, that there's an awful lot of slippage from the woman who's drunk so much that she's sort of lying there and, you know, is basically completely incapable through to a woman who's had a few drinks and is a bit merry and might do something that she wouldn't otherwise have done. And I think we've got that slippage, and I think that's very um, dangerous to take that extreme case and then move it over into a much, um, you know, a much more normal um, activity, which um, happens all the time. Um, I was going to look at this question of what was uh, uh, that was asked at the back about, you know, what is a victim? Is there any such thing as a victim? And try and wrap up a few questions in that. I just want to say really clearly and, and very much in response to what um, Nye was saying. In my view, nobody can be a victim of emotional abuse because emotional abuse should not be considered in any way, shape or form to be a crime. It is somebody talking to someone else in a way that is really a matter for those two people to um, decide and to discuss themselves. And to come to a point that was made at the back, where we have someone who, is, who sees themselves as described as a victim of emotional abuse, that to me is entirely degrading. It's an absolutely degrading idea that you wouldn't be able to sort out the way that somebody is basically talking to you. If you don't like how they're talking to you, then go and do something else. I would slightly disagree, though, with the way that it was um, put at the back. I mean, maybe I'm being a bit of a lawyer here, but I would see some people as real victims. Um, you know, they are clearly victims of crimes. If somebody's been beaten up, whether by their partner or whether by a stranger, then clearly they are a victim in that process. But I think what I would want to do is to slightly separate the crime victim, sort of legal understanding, from the social um, understanding of that. And really, for people even who have been victims of serious crimes, to help them to then put that behind them and move forward and not see themselves as victims going forward. And I'll just throw something out, which I think will be a bit contentious for some people in the audience. And I think in that context, it's actually a shame that more and more people are wanting, really, to see themselves as victims, including male victims of domestic okay. violence. Can I Thank you. Just... Nigel, do you want to respond to that? Can I say a couple of things before I get into the, what I really want to say? First of all, I'm not here saying criminal law is the solution to these problems. I'm a criminal practitioner talking to you about what criminal law can do and what the criminal <coughs> law should do. I, of course, fully accept that there is a wide battery of measures from refuges to appropriate support through the welfare system, uh, for victims of both genders of domestic violence, and I in no way diminish the importance of those. But my belief is, and I hope the vast majority of people in this room will agree is, if a crime has been committed, that that person should be prosecuted and that person should be sentenced appropriately. And this isn't, much as it is often and regrettably in the course of this discussion has become, a genderized issue. It's not a gender issue. This is about victims of crime victims of violence. And whether that violence takes place in a pub or it take place, takes place at your home, it's the same offence that you'll be charged with. It may be that the particular context means that we need to approach the criminal proceedings in slightly different ways to in order the best result and the right result to come out legally speaking. But it's the same crime. It's an assault. And when um, the last speaker, and forgive me, the reason I keep saying last speaker is I don't know if it's Hello. doctor or it's uh, uh, m miss. Mi miss, miss, <laughs> <Whatever>. <laughs> not doctor. Um, we already criminalise emotional abuse. Most people in this room won't realise that I can assault you over the phone. Assault, the most prototypical offence, doesn't require any physical contact, and I can do it at a remote. If I think, make you think you're about to receive physical violence, I've assaulted you, whether or not I actually ever come around to hit you. And so the law has, for a very long time, recognised that emotional harm, psychological harm, is as real and is as important to the criminal law as physical harm. And all that this definition is doing is recognizing that and recognizing that therefore we need to look at the wide context rather than focusing on the very specific. In relation to the rule of law issue, I don't think there will have to be a lot of case law for this. Uh, just as when the offense of harassment came in, 
there wasn't a lot of case law because what the, High, the House of Lords Supreme Court will say is, well, it's fact specific. Obviously, unattractive or unreasonable behavior is not sufficient. It needs to be sufficiently serious to constitute a criminal offense, but we're going to leave it to individual juries to make up their mind. And if 12 of them agree that this behavior is so abhorrent that it goes beyond the unattractive into the criminal, then we will accept that judgment. I think of the Supreme Court's definition of pornography. They said, we can't define it, but we know it when we see it. And we all know what we mean when we're talking about coercive, controlling, threatening relationships. We're not talking about me telling my girlfriend to do the dishes. We're not talking about my girlfriend telling me not to buy a suit. We're talking about something that we can all recognize and that if 12 of you randomly selected from society, having heard all the facts, having heard what the defendant has to say through best counsel possible, agree that that behavior is so bad that it falls into that category, that person has committed an offense. Great, thanks. And Kate, very quickly. Okay, well, the, the idea, the, the question about are women being degraded as legal subjects and um, are we getting this sort of uh, victim, vic, rising vic, association with victimhood with people? I think um, I, I think they probably are being degraded, as are lots of other vulnerable groups by being seen as vulnerable. But I think that also brings enhanced protections for some people. So I think overall you've got quite a complex picture of a bit of over control, along with under control, with certain with certain groups within that that broader net. So I don't think it's very easy to say uh, that it's just, it's not just, um, it's not just women being degraded. They're also being, um, getting access to enhanced protections at the same time. On the issue, which we haven't sort of touched upon about, um, which the two gentlemen raised about male violence. I think I would always just, I didn't caveat my discussion, but I'd say male violence is overlooked. Uh, there are issues about masculinity, but, um, and, and men feeling okay about coming forward. But I just think, I do not buy that domestic violence is not a gendered crime for me. It just out and out it's is. Okay. It's not, I don't think okay. it is. I think right. the evidence well, suggests no, that No, 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 no. Sorry, I'm, as a criminal law practitioner as well, I'm very, very surprised at the stance that Knight's taken. Um, simply because, as a practitioner, he should know that when you widen the definition of a crime, um, you can't leave it to police officers, the courts and the juries to apply their judgment at every step of the process. If you criminalise certain behaviour, such as widening the definition, the police will have to act on that. The judges will have to direct the juries as to what they could constitute as criminal behaviour, and the juries will decide accordingly. So I'm very surprised that he can accept so readily the widening of the definition and say, well, we'll leave it to the due process to let things come out in the wash. What does the panel think and know about the... There's a, a, a part of putting the victim at the centre of the criminal justice process. What do you know and think about the initiative where there's a pilot to put uh, to keep tra so-called traumatised victims out of court so their evidence is given via recording? Uh, apparently the pilot started, but I'd, I'd like to know whether, for example, in your uh, field, you were consulted on this. Who made this decision and who's going to judge on this, who's going to judge whether these pilots are success, given it, jury trials are, is a democratic issue. I can't, I'm surprised it's, it's gone ahead so easily without it being contested. I think now you actually have made almost the most chilling point for me, which in, in the sense of saying, well, actually, someone shouting at you down the phone is equal to someone presumably bashing you over the head with a phone, and Legally I don't think it is, is a problem it of... Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, in the, in the sense, like, here you are, yeah, that, that is what you did say. And in the sense, it isn't just the law intervening, but I can see how individuals then get a sense of a passiveness when all crimes are equated, and you sort of cannot, you know, someone shouting, you know, a man shouting at his partner in the street is equated to a man beating his wife up in the street or his partner in the street and then your idea of when you should intervene how that happens becomes I, I think it it pacifies us all and I think Jackie your thing around how did people not feed that young lad 
when he was starving is because when every family and everyone is frightened that every family is under the cosh, that actually we become more isolated and not able to identify and intervene when we should. And I think that is the problem with this extension. Of this I was interested in Nye's example um, and the conclusion he drew from it, namely that an assault by a man on his wife in a private place is necessarily worse than the same assault on a stranger in a public place. Yeah. Assume all other material facts to be equal. Um, it seems to me that the conclusion that you drew ignores one very important, uh, yeah, in, ignores one very important social value, and that is the social value of personal autonomy. The example you gave of a man and a wife falling out um, in a private place enables them to reach their to negotiate the problem themselves. There is a range of responses that each of them can think about. It may be reconciliation. It may be revenge. Um, it may be anger, it may be sadness, it may be divorce, who knows? The point is there is a whole range of things that they, between themselves, can consider. That, it seems to me, is a very important value. It's the value of personal autonomy, and it tends to be ignored when it is put into the forensic atmosphere of a courtroom, um, which I think is, is the mistake you made. You disregarded the far more important social value in play. I would just like to say that... Um Nye is one of the few people on this panel I really wholeheartedly agree with. Thank you. And I think <laughs> the most two chilling points that we've actually heard is, for a start, consent. There is no grey area with consent. Consent is when you are in a full, fully functioning state of mind and you enthusiastically agree. If anybody even suggests that a lesser standard than that is okay, I really, A, wonder why they want someone who isn't in the right state of mind and enthusiastically consenting. But it also really worries me that we accept that as a, we accept that there's gray areas. Also this idea that um, emotional abuse doesn't exist. Um, actually, something that you said, if you don't like what you're hearing, why don't you just leave? Which I thought really chillingly echoes all of the, ex the reasons of, we're not taking domestic abuse seriously, because if it was a serious problem, she'd have left by now which, again, is really worrying. I'm horrified, Helen, by your lack of understanding about this situation. These women are groomed into these things. This is about normally about a stream of behaviours which Nye refers to finally as an act. And it's when that act itself, after 36 attempts normally, of a woman being beaten up before she'd actually seek help. We all know that as a statistic. But to not understand the level of grooming that goes on, the level of intimidation, the level of fear, the women who've been in those situations are, are actually pe like people who have been tortured, who've been set up and put down and set up and put down and set up and put down. And the very nice legalistic arguments they were making completely overrules any idea of what the reality is for these okay. women. Hi, uh, there was a lot of talk about stereotypes. Do you think the expanded definition of abuse, perhaps, um, like some women, if they don't fit the sort of stereotype of victim, they're kind of like, just brushed aside in court. I mean, in court, I mean, I know some barristers, not necessarily barristers, but they're sort of women are asked to dress in a certain way. So that they, not necessarily, but I mean, they are encouraged to dress in a certain way so that they fulfill the jury's expectation of what a victim looks like. So do you think that perhaps the expanded definition would, these women that can stand up for themselves, and so that they are not seen as not a victim because they can stand up for themselves and they are educated, and there's stuff to do around with this was the trial, the pilot trial of the, it was at least in Greater Manchester where you could go and check your partner's history uh, to see whether domestic abuse in Helen touch on the issue of trust and the way that's been uh, now being like uh, battled out in the battle between the public and private divide. And I just thought that pilot itself was extremely worrying. Like that, the fact that you know you don't believe people are capable of rehabilitation. There's other issues to do with the. Uh, penal system and stuff, whereas women what the panel's for to wear on that. With our unwritten constitution, you know, all, all law we have to interpret it, and there's always a, like some degree of the court, you know, that's the role of the courts. So just to like pick up on what Kate was saying about enhanced protection, should we not generally be condoning an effort on the part of government and, um, and the lawmakers to widen that net and actually to potentially protect a whole new realm of women. And if they're being groomed, then maybe 
our expansive definition might mean that we catch those relationships before they get to the high risk level. I'd just like to point out something that um, strikes me, it, which is that the social and political and legal status of women has, um, has risen, certainly in my lifetime, tremendously. And yet the anxiety about the capacity of women to actually exercise judgment has taken, um, gone in the opposite direction, it seems. And I wonder if there isn't a more general connection to a more general feeling in society or amongst all of us about our problems of actually exercising judgment, of making decisions and sticking to them, of um, feeling permitted to make decisions, to, make, um, to say no. And I think that might be a more general uh, problem. It's not just confined to women. And perhaps we identify with some of this uh, more extreme sense of vulnerability because more generally we feel a sense of uh, a lack of authority, a lack of being in control ourselves. And that's where we have to bring the law in. We haven't <laughs> used words like sadists and masochists. Um, some people actually like violence and attract violence. Some women will have conversations in which they say some man is much too nice and gentle. They much prefer this rough trap. Uh, a lot of women do prefer that. And I, I think we're oversimplifying. Relationships are very complex, and I think it's a very difficult area for the public to intervene. Great. Thank you very much. One minute each to answer the questions. There are three reasons why we criminalise things in this country. One is because it causes harm, two because it stops harm happening in the future, and three to the creation and maintenance of standards. Emotional harm, psychological harm is real harm, and that's why for centuries we have criminalised it in the form of assault, in the form of harassment, in the form of threats to kill. This is a merely an extension and acceptance that this is another form of emotional harm. Two, prevention. The reason why we criminalize knives in public places is not because we're frightened of shiny things. It's because we recognize that that's a way of preventing future harms that are much more serious. We all know about the problems with escalation. Low-level violence builds up to more serious violence, and that's why you have these horrendous statistics about two women, and uh, I think it's a week, being killed by their partners or ex-partners. Part of the law is to prevent that. And it's far from being a case of focusing on too many cases and missing the big cases. It's a matter of intervening early to avoid the sort of horrendous statistics that have been brought up. And the third reason is the creation and maintenance of moral standards. Cases like Justin Lee Collins go into the public and we see that that is not acceptable. And that helps to create and maintain the moral standards that our society should be putting forward. That this sort of coercive relationship is not acceptable. Thanks, Nye. Uh, Kate? Okay, well, I think um, there are uh, some protections that are being advanced by the changes in the criminal justice system, but overall, I would say that it's paternalistic and controlling. And also that there is perhaps a whiff of elitism about saying, well, we all think that as domestic violence. I just don't think that lots of women do recognise that as domestic violence. So I, 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 so I wonder what's going on in terms of the class dynamics there about what we're defining, you know, who whose um, interests are like to be served by the by that sort of rationale, and then I think just I would reiterate my earlier point that what we're talking about when we talk about the criminal justice system is the bit that. It's the quick fix bit that when we think, oh, we want to do something, let's talk about and focus on the criminal justice system. But in a way, it distracts us from the much wider issues. And if we were really serious about domestic violence, we would start looking at. Thank you, Kate. Barbara. No clapping. <laughs> I'd like to deal with the specific question that was raised about the pilot study, which I think is very, very troubling um, because particularly when you look at the atmosphere in which these kinds of cases are being tried now, it's an atmosphere in which guilt is virtually presumed. And so if you then have a scenario where the complainant is not even prepared to show her face, what kind of system of open justice is that? I mean, it's not even someone appearing behind a full, full face in a cab, it's someone who won't even appear at all. And it's a tendency that you see in other types of cases as well. There was a sexual harassment case um, which was reported in the press um, where the complainant wouldn't come to court. Now, this was her own case, which she had initiated, and yet she wasn't prepared to come to court, and it was all about the problems the tribunal had trying to, to deal with that non-appearance on her part. Uh, and you find it in other types of cases as well, where people are not prepared to come and be seen and assessed by the judge or by the peers who sit on the jury. And it seems to me that's fundamentally undermining the system of justice that we have, and we should be resisting this um, because it's not necessary. Judges do ensure that witnesses are treated fairly. Barristers are told they must 
uh, address them um, courteously. These are all things that don't need to be reinvented. So I find it a troubling trend. Thanks, Barbara. Jackie? Just responding to that, special measures are no longer a pilot. They are actually available now in, in the courts. Um, and they are there to protect what they, what's described and defined um, as vulnerable and intimidated victims and witnesses. And what we find is, is that the, the, the reason why special measures are brought in is because there's lots of rights, and quite rightly, to defend a, a defendant, um, but victims aren't represented in court. There's nobody there um, to represent them or, or, de or demonstrate any, any concerns for them, the CPS are there to represent the state. The defendant does have their own team and have been working on the evidence and discussing the evidence for months and months. Uh, the lady commented about victims being told what to wear. Victims aren't given any advice and, and very little information about going to court. And so that is a case where they're not, they're not told because the CPS would be accused of coaching. Uh, plenty of advice given to defendants about what to say and analysing the evidence, but the, but the system isn't weighted evenly still. The introduction of special measures was uh, to enable vulnerable victims and witnesses to give their best evidence uh, when in some cases they under the old scheme they wouldn't have been able to uh, and special measures don't actually stop victims being seen by the jury uh, the judges or or the, the the magistrates because if it's a screen it's literally just a screen that means the uh, victim or witness can't see the defendant because we all know although Helen says emotional abuse doesn't exist if, if you've if you have an abuser they only have to look at you a certain way for, for the victim to feel intimidated. So special measures are being brought in, uh, and for children as well, uh, by video, the use of video link, the use of screens. But what it actually means is that abusers can no longer deliberately target vulnerable and intimidated witnesses because they know that that person isn't going to be strong enough to go to court. It would, people with learning disabilities, people with other disabilities, mental health issues. Uh, the CPS, the police used to say, we won't bother taking that case to court because they won't make a good witness. Well, now special measures actually uh, rebalances that to actually ensure that vulnerable people do get a chance to get justice for harms that they'd have suffered. Great, thank you Jackie and Helen. Um, a lot of people have been saying what's been the most chilling um, thing that's been said in this debate so I thought maybe I'd finish with that and I was thinking what did I find the most chilling of all and I think what I found the most chilling was the description of women being groomed by their partners a concept that developed in relation to children and is actually, I'd say, quite problematic even when we're talking about children. But the idea that women would be groomed by the way that their partners emotionally abuse them I think really does underline the way that this discussion, the expansion of domestic violence, does degrade women as legal subjects. Can we thank our panel? <laughs>